this uh, afternoon I'm going to talk about uh, nanotechnology and opportunities and challenges. And uh, as Brian said, that though I'm at the ANU, and I also have some honorary appointments in other parts of the world, and I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be able to interact with my colleagues in other parts of the world. So before I proceed further, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues uh, at the, in, in my group, and uh, particularly these are the people, those who really make things happening. And uh, I really want to sincerely thank them, and then without their contribution and without their work, there's no talk here. And I also have got a long list of collaborators. In fact, I haven't listed them, and I collaborated with scientists from 25 plus countries, and it's been great fun. And that's the beauty of science, is to be able to really collaborate across the boundaries and uh, work together to be able to really develop the technologies and then understanding the, the world around us. And typically in my group, typically, typically I know 10, 12 nationalities at any time and very bright uh, young researchers, and it's really fun to work with these guys, and then I really want to sincerely thank them. And I also want to take this opportunity to thank our funding agencies, Australian Research Council, and also Australian federal government with the NCRIS program, which allows us to be able to really you know, uh, uh, the establish and then access the facilities which are needed in order to be able to do the nanotechnology research which we are doing. And also we get some funding from the US Air Force Office of Scientific Research as well. So here is overview of my talk, and then I'm going to really tell you about what is nanotechnology and uh, why nanotechnology is so important and how to make nanostructures, and then some examples of nanotechnology. In fact, uh, I'm not going to tell you about all about my own research, then I thought that that may be too boring for you, I may go too much into detail. I just want to keep it at a level where you can really see and appreciate what nanotechnology can really have an impact in the longer term in the lives of the people in the society. And I also put the nanotechnology for cars, because in fact, in the earlier this year, and then I happened to give a talk at the uh, vintage and classic car club, which I'm a member. In fact, that is my classic car, and then Brian likes his Teslas, and I like old cars. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, that car, car is old as, uh, as old as I am in 1957 or so. So anyway, but uh, in fact, Joe Mikalev, who is there, and then my friend who helped me to really buy that car, and I'll draw some conclusions there. So what is nano? And whenever we say nano, we say that it's a billionth of a meter. So when you say that billionth of a meter, it sounds like words, but you really don't have any appreciation of what that is. And of course, I can also talk about one millionth of a millimeter, but again, it doesn't really make sense what is one billionth of a millimeter or so. So really, if you go and look at the scales here, and then the ant is about five millimeters, and uh, dust mites are about 200 microns, and then human hair is about 10 to 50 microns or so, though I'm not qualified to talk about hair after losing all of it, <laughs> And I understand that uh, all of our hair diameters of the width is quite different. And uh, so that's why you say that 10 microns to 50 microns or so. And then the red blood cells are typically about two to five microns. And then the DNA is about two and a half nanometers. And five atoms of silicon is one nanometer or so. So really we are talking about atomic scale. When you talk about nanometer, and then we're really dealing with the atomic scale and manipulating atoms. A carbon nanotube, which I'll come back to, is about two nanometers in diameter or so. So really, what we are trying, if you take the planet Earth, and our astronomer Royal he is here, and if you shrink the planet Earth by some amount, and to a size of a tennis ball, and you take the tennis ball and shrink it by the same amount, and you get to the nanoscale. So that really gives you the dimensions that are so tiny, tiny dimensions which we're dealing with. I put you Lego blocks here, and all of us played with Lego blocks when we were a child. And then really, we are trying to play Lego and, uh, of course, using expensive tools. And uh, instead of using Lego blocks, what we are doing is that we are using atoms and molecules, engineering them to be able to make a wide variety of structures and with new properties so that we can use them for a wide range of applications. And why nanomaterials are so important? What is so interesting and exciting about nanomaterials? When you take a material and you shrink it to the nanoscale, two main things happen. One thing is the surface atoms, large surface to volume ratio. The number of atoms which are on the surface becomes quite significant with respect to the number of atoms within the volume of the material. So these atoms on the surface want to react with something, so that's why you can use them for catalysis or sensing of various gases and a range of things. Here is a schematic of a carbon nanotube. As you can see, all the atoms are on the surface in the case of carbon nanotube, and inside what you got is simply and the air or vacuum. So now, in fact, you can really use these carbon nanotubes, fill this gap in this middle with hydrogen so that you can use it for hydrogen storage because hydrogen is seen as a clean gas 
which could be used in the future technologies in terms of uh, you know, running cars to all sorts of things. And because uh, you can have hydrogen and oxygen, essentially, as a byproduct is going to be water. So that's why there's a lot of interest of ability to be able to store hydrogen, not using big tanks, which are going to be inflammable, but be able to really be able to do that on atmospheric pressure or so. Also, carbon nanotubes are lightweight and also high strength, which I'll come back to and I'll tell you. But also, if you take a flat surface, atomically flat surface, you really make it as a nanostructured surface, something like this. The properties change again. The bulk material, and then you end up changing a little bit of the surface properties, like uh, bumps like this, and then essentially you end up getting new properties. In fact, this nature does that beautifully, which I'll come back to. But the second thing which happens when you go to nanoscale is the quantum effects come into picture. So here is a material called cadmium selenide. If I take a chunk of cadmium selenide, it looks like that. If I really try to get some light out of it, it's, uh, the, it emits light in the infrared region of the spectrum. So you cannot see it. But whereas the same cadmium selenide, if I shrink it to the nanoscale, and suddenly the properties change, I can get different colors of light. So really, I'm changing by na small amounts, and I can get the blue light and green light and the red light. I cannot explain that phenomena using classical physics, so I need to bring in quantum physics, which I'll come back to and I'll show you why they're important. In fact, uh, these, uh, carbon, these, uh, uh, these uh, the quant quantum dots, we call them as nanocrystals, they could be used in the displays. In fact, Samsung recently released uh, uh, a TV called Quantum Dot TV or QD TV. In fact, they have already been using these uh, quantum dots or nanocrystals of uh, these semiconductors in order to be able to get a bright colors and a crisp colors also in the TVs and other things. So the same nanocrystals could be used for solar cells and other applications as well. So that's why there's a lot of interest in trying to understand the, how the materials behave when you go to the nanoscale and then try to use them for applying for a range of applications. And the nature is already doing that. So of course, this, I've, I've taken some examples of nature so that to tell you that uh, nature is already beautifully doing nanotechnology. So the butterflies. So of course, we see lots of butterflies, and they've got a beautiful colors. So is the color coming from the chemical pigments, or something else is happening? Why we see different colors of uh, uh, light being reflected from these, uh, uh, the butterflies, for example? But it turns out, if you go and look at these wings of these butterflies under an electron microscope, you can see the bone material and then there's some air gaps there. If you go and look at the close-up of this one, this bone material and air gap and bone material, that changes the optical properties, so thereby the light reflected from this structure will be different depending on how much gap is there and what is the width of that particular bone material or so. It is nothing to do with the chemical pigments. Essentially, structuring of the bone is the one which gives those colors. It's a really a physics which is working very beautifully in the area of, uh, in the case of butterflies by, by nature. So in fact, that means we can be able to really try to understand, for example, you can different, create different colors without having to use chemical pigments by essentially ordering the materials with the, some material and the air gap and some material, thereby depending on what is the width of those materials, you can end up having different colors of light or so. But again, when you go to the nanoscale and you can create a faster computer chips, which I will come back to, you can put really more of memory and a faster communications and also higher energy efficiency in terms of making any of these electronic and uh, wide variety of devices which we deal with. So now let me come back to nature again, lotus leaf. In fact, the structure which I showed you earlier, and when I try to create the bumps on the surface and its properties change, in fact, that is the electron micrograph of the lotus leaf. So we all know that whenever you put a droplet of water on the lotus leaf, and then it doesn't wet the surface of lotus leaf. That is because of this uh, nano, nanostructured surface, which doesn't allow to really water to be in contact with this particular thing. We call it as a hydrophobicity in science. So really, if the nature is already doing that, can we learn from nature? Can we really mimic that? So Brian has already mentioned about self-cleaning surfaces. Really, can we really coat, so for example, the walls with some paint which can self-clean itself? So thereby, whenever rain comes, all the dust can be pulled, uh, the, captured by these, uh, these uh, water, molecule, water droplets because of the fact that the surface has not been wet, wetted by, because of the fact that you can have the nanoparticles in the paint, for example. So really, we can do these things. And in fact, uh, we can create fabrics. So here is a case when if you spill wine, and then, of course, you have to go home and then explain to your partner and how sloppy you have been or what you have been doing. 
But whereas if they are not, don't wet the surface of this uh, fabric, that means you don't even know that you have spilled the wine on your shirt and you don't have to go and clean it and other things. So these hydrophobic surfaces are so. And again, already there are shirts available. In fact, uh, president of the Chinese Academy of Sciences has given me a tie, which also has, doesn't, really, doesn't get really wet or anything of that sort, and which is really very interesting. And uh, you can, in fact, buy the fabrics and the things. And again, it is making use of the nanotechnology because you don't wet the surface or so. So really, nanotechnology is expected to have a huge impact on all industry sectors. And in the case of medicine and health and a drug delivery, targeted drug delivery, which I come back to, and also treatments of cancer, which I will come back to, and also in information technology in terms of being able to really create a high density data storage by using nanotechnology, molecular switches for making uh, transistors by using one molecular layer so thereby I can really make uh, one atom layer acting like a tra transistor, as essentially like a switch instead of using silicon, which we are using, and energy production, for example, hydrogen cars, and uh, fuel cells for hydrogen, and again made out of na using nanotechnology, and also flexible solar cells, printable solar cells. Instead of using solar cells on the roof, in the future you may have essentially a curtain, which is en providing energy to you because you can really create the printable solar cells in the future. In fact, CSIRO is really developing some of this technology. Many groups are working globally as well. But also new materials which are lightweight and stronger materials. So that means you can really build skyscrapers and uh, with uh, using these stronger materials also, which I can come back to. And food and water and the environment. Again, nanotechnology can help you to be able to do the environmental remediation by really uh, really stabilizing the dirty materials which are there in the environment and be able to make them as a stable compounds. And if there is uh, any oil spill, you can use smart membranes which are only sucking up the oil but won't do any sucking up of the water. So thereby you can really remove the oil spills and other things. It's going to have a huge impact in this particular area. But obviously you are developing also some instruments because whenever you are really developing new technologies, you need to also develop the new instruments to be able to manipulate materials and also see what we are making because normal existing equipment is, is not able to look at that and be able to do that. So the new technologies or new equipment is also plays an important role. So of course, some of my economics friends, and of course these days when you talk to anybody, people want to know how much money you're going to make and then uh, you're valued based on that one. And in fact, uh, Lux Research Corporation in US has done this prediction in 2004 that uh, nanotechnology-based industries will be similar to the size of, that of the information and communications technologies by 2020 or so, and about 15% of the global manufacturing out will be output will be dependent on nanotechnology. And about $2.6 trillion of economic activity is expected of that. But till 2008, these projections were really been followed very well by this Lux Research Corporation, but of course, in 2008, we had a global financial crisis. The investment by the industry, investment by the governments in the nanotechnology has been reduced. So this may not happen in, by 2020. It may happen by 2030 or so. Nanotechnology is going to make an impact in all industry sectors. So how to make these nanostructures? And then we talk about two types of uh, methods. And one, we call it as a top-down method. And in this case, essentially like a sculptor and take a stone or a piece of rock and then really sculpt structures so that you can really create the beautiful structures here. So essentially that's what we do using this top-down process. In fact, silicon chips which are used in your computers and other things are made, make, made using that particular process, which I'll show you some pictures of that. And you can really go to as small as 10 nanometers using this particular technology, which we call it as a top-down approach. The other approach is called as a bottom-up approach. In this case, what we do is that, uh, like a potter, Potter takes clay and then really molds into whatever the shape you want to have. So instead of using clay, what we are doing is that we are using atoms and molecules and then be able to create nanostructures. We can make them as, as small as one nanometer up to hundreds of nanometers or so. So both the techniques one can use, top-down approach and a bottom-up approach. And the chemists and physicists, like, uh, physicists and engineers like to do top-down approach and chemists like to do the bottom-up approach. In my group, we do both. We try to combine both of them in fact, you get the best out of both uh, by uh, best out of these structures whenever you combine both the top-down and bottom-up approaches. So here is an example of a computer chip. So, and in fact, uh, these days silicon and uh, silicon wafers are like uh, a dinner plate, about 12 inch in diameter, and then they are processed by the top-down processes. And you can see that the features in this particular case is about 90 nanometers in this case. 
In fact, this is a slide which I've created about 10 years back or so. And uh, I said at the time that by in, we, are we are using the features which have 90 nanometer feature sizes will be reaching the 20 nanometers in the de next decade or so. But it turns out that by 2012, already you know, we have reached to the uh, 22 nanometers. To 2014, Intel has already released the computer chips which have got the smallest features of 40 nanometers or so. And uh, Samsung has released in 2017 computer chips which have got us 10 nanometer features. And the TSMC is expected to release seven nanometer features from Taiwan um, uh, Semiconductor uh, Corporation and by 2018 or so. We are really going to few atoms of silicon we are using to be able to make these transistors and then be able to really make these uh, computer chips and all things. So the smaller the devices, you can pack more of them and smaller the devices, you can switch them on and off faster. That means you can do the calculations uh, much faster than when you've got a larger size devices. So in fact, we have got, uh, we do the top-down approach as well. In fact, this is an electron beam lithography system in our laboratory, and it's a $2 million, $2 million machine, and we can really write the patterns using electron beams, and we can create features as small as 20 nanometers or so. In fact, we are now trying to really establish the future facilities whenever the NCRIS program gives us money to be able to even go to as small as two to three nanometers or so by using the top-down processes because uh, the properties change quite significantly when you go to those uh, di dimensions. So, but whereas in the case of my colleagues in uh, chemistry, what they do is that they use uh, a, a container like this and then they put one material, which is in this case cadmium, and then introduce small amounts of selenium here. So thereby by controlling the temperature of this beaker here, and then what they do is that they end up changing the size of these nanoparticles and then control it precisely. So this is a so-called the bottom-up approach. And in fact, here is an example of the case where these cadmium selenide, again an example, where by changing them from 2.5 nanometers up to 1.4 nanometers, you can precisely change the emission wavelength from these structures, which are now currently used in uh, uh, TVs and displays and other things as well. So really precise engineering and which can be done and by using the bottom-up approaches as well. So it's a matter of uh, what is your preference and what are the applications and which technique you want to do in order to be able to make these uh, nanostructures uh, for various applications. In my, in my own laboratory, we have been doing one atom layer by one atom layer deposition. And here I'm showing you monolayers. One monolayer is about one quarter of a nanometer. You could, I got a four nanometer, four monolayers, that means about a nanometer. It, likes, it tries to stay as a two-dimensional material and if I put one more model layer, and suddenly they form into these so-called quantum dots. In fact, we demonstrated lasers made out of these particular devices. And uh, so this is what we were doing in 90s to mid-2000s or so, trying to demonstrate a wide range of devices like lasers and photodetectors and other things. So in terms of using this, uh, I'll show you lots of applications. I've, shown, I've told you how do we make these nanostructures. And here is an example of using nanomaterials or nanoparticles. And uh, for example, if you're using nanoparticles of zinc oxide, which is used in the, uh, these days in the sunscreen, for example, and they are so tiny, and then the visible light can pass through, and that means you don't see any light being reflected back or scattered back. But then they absorb the UV light. So that's why when you apply something like this, you don't even see you applied this sunscreen because of the fact that they're allowing the visible light to pass through. That's why you don't uh, see that you applied that one but at the same time, they're doing a good job for you. But whereas if you use about a micron size particles in the sunscreen, you see this uh, you know, zinc cream and other things, and you can see light being scattered, and then you can see the difference between a nanoscale sunscreen to the, the uh, micro micron scale sunscreen, and then big difference in terms of the light scattering properties. Again, we can use these nanoparticles of zinc oxide or titanium oxide in paints. For example, the wood gets uh, degraded because of the UV radiation in the sunlight. So now if you can have a paint which only absorbs the UV light but don't, allow, don't absorb the visible light, that means you can really still see the, the, the patterns in the wood and other things, but still they are protecting the wood thereby. Wood can last for a longer time, which is very environmentally friendly as well. So also that uh, people have been developing the so-called super paramagnetic materials. So in this case, you use nanoparticles of magnetic materials. You can functionalize them so that you can really send them to your brain where you got a brain tumor, these nanoparticles only attach themselves to the brain tumor. So then from outside, you can apply the magnetic field on and off, on and off. By doing that one, what happens is that this nanoparticle is magnetized, demagnetized, 
and then start generating heat. The amount of heat generated is sufficient to be able to kill the tumor without affecting the surrounding uh, the, the uh, brain. So that means the side effects are less, and you're also precise engineering, you're able to do that one. So really, these nanoparticles are really opening up a lot of opportunities. Some people are using cerium oxide nanoparticles in fuel tanks so that you can get more efficiency from the existing fuels as well. So these nanoparticles have been widely used for a range of applications. So when I talk about tennis balls, and uh, these are uh, tennis balls here, you can see that whenever you got, uh, after some time, the, the air has been uh, leaking out, and because of the fact that you have at a nano, nano size pores in this rubber, so then air leaks out. So now, if I can put nanoparticles which are really filling these gaps, so that means air is not going to leak out, so that means you can use your tennis balls for a longer time, and Wilson has already developed this one about more than 10 years back or so, and that means you are able to use this uh, already nanotechnology in your day-to-day -day life. But also the food packaging. And whenever you say that the food is spoiled, that's because of the oxidation. Because of the packaging allows the small amounts of oxygen to leak through gradually, and after some time, food gets spoiled. So now, if you can really fill these gaps in this packaging by using nanoparticles, so thereby you don't allow the oxygen to get in, so thereby you can use the food for a longer time without wasting it, and that's why the people are really developing nano packaging for food packaging and other things as well. Some of you might have heard of graphene, this wonder material, which has led to Nobel Prize in 2010. Probably this is one of the materials which has led to Nobel Prize from the development uh, to the Nobel Prize within six or seven years or so. So this is nothing but a layer of graphene, uh, sorry, carbon. So if you take graphite, and then essentially what you got is a layer of carbon one on top of the other. Graphite is a very soft material, and uh, you can use it for lubricants and other things. But when you only take peel off one layer of this carbon, which is like a sheet like this, and then these properties are extremely strong. So this is one of the strongest material we can really think of. You can really make in the, uh, in the, in the, in the world currently, for example. But again, you can take this one sheet of car carbon and then fold into a, a ball, and then we get something called buckyballs, and then they end up having quite different properties. You can also fold them in this, in this way, then you create the so-called carbon nanotubes. Everything is one layer of carbon, you fold it, and you end up getting new properties again, those carbon nanotubes which I will come back to. So really, very, very exciting area. It's used for electronics applications as well as mechanical applications or so. Because, in fact, it turns out that this one has not been done using any exotic materials. Professor Geim and his student, what they've done is that they've taken graphite, they took in, taken a scotch tape, and just peeled off one layer, and then tried to study those properties, then they found very interesting properties from those ones. And in fact, this is a one atom layer thick graphene here. It is also transparent, which could be used for displays, and because it's a strong material, which could be used for a range of applications like pressure sensors to resonators and other things. It's also a very good electronic material, which could be used for transistors and displays and a range of things. So this graphene is really opened up a lot of opportunities of how to really do research on the 2D materials, one atom layer thick, really precisely one atom layer thick even we are talking about less than one nanometer or so. So taking this carbon, and then you fold this way, and then you create the so-called zigzag pattern of the carbon nanotubes. But if you fold this way, you end up getting these armchair patterns here. So this nanotube has got a quite different properties than this nanotube. One of them acts like a metal, like a silver or gold. One of them acts like a semiconductor, like silicon, which is used in our computer chips. So it means the same material, how you fold it changes properties quite significantly. Again, these carbon nanotubes are very strong, and people are trying to really develop a range of things. So here is an example of the case where, in fact, at the ANU Research School of Physics, and my colleagues have developed these uh, single-walled carbon nanotubes, multi-walled carbon nanotubes, or even bamboo-shaped carbon nanotubes or so. They all have got a quite different properties, and then we are trying to understand their properties and then thinking about how can we use them. For example, they could be used for bulletproof fabrics. If you can really have got fabrics which are embedded with the carbon nanotubes because of their strength and bullets cannot go through, and then people are really now trying to develop these sorts of fabrics embedding these carbon nanotubes because of their strength. But also lightweight because of the fact that they're only talking about a one atom layer of uh, carbon which has been really created, these carbon nanotubes. And also people are trying to develop composites using these carbon nanotubes or so. 
For example, lots of composite materials have been used in the A380, which is about 15 tons lighter than that of the, any aircraft which you're dealing with. That means they can go long distances. Also, mechanically, they are very good materials. That means you can really have, they can flex about four meters or so while take off and other things. But of course, the, these are all, the, some of the slides are from US, and you can also see some stealth uh, bombers and other things also, because if you can use you know, lightweight materials and also stronger, I can also use less uh, uh, fuel. That means they can go to long distances and be able to do the task which is needed by the community, uh, the uh, purpose which, the task which, mission which you've got. Let me now towards medicine. In fact, the most exciting things which we are expected to have with the nanotechnology is in the area of medicine. It's moving towards personalized med medicine. So in fact, the National Institute of Health in US has created a separate center called Cancer Nanotechnology, where you can detect cancer at the early stages of development and also be able to treat cancer precisely in a targeted way. So here is an example of the case where this work is done at Harvard University, Charlie Lieber's group, what they've been doing is that uh, we make these nano wires and you functionalize them so that they will only be picking up one particular cancer marker. In this case, simultaneously, you're able to detect a multiple cancer markers simultaneously, so that means you don't have to do one test for one, another one to another one. That means it becomes a really point of care de de detection. You can go to your doctor, you can take a drop of blood, and then within minutes, you'll be able to really see whether you've got cancer or not, rather than you have to wait for a one week or two weeks and then worry about whether, uh, what, you know, what your reality is going to be. Really, single molecules of cancer can be detected. In fact, this is an important thing. For example, if you wait till your cancer is detected, then it's metastasized. That means you really have to be bombarded with the entire body with the heavy doses of chemicals, radiotherapy, and chemotherapy. If you can detect at the early stages of at a single molecule level, so that means you can start the treatment at a much earlier stage before the cancer metastasizes. That means you got a much better prognosis in terms of uh, being able to live for a longer period or so. So for example, you can use a wide variety of nanoparticles for really treating cancer, polymer materials and polymer micelles and the carbon nanotubes, essentially filling these ones with uh, the drugs which you want to really transport and then be able to precisely transport them to the localized cancer cells and then activate them at this place. So here's a case where you got a cancer cell and then these polymer coated drug molecules which have been really transported through this membrane and then they get into this one and then start destroying this tumor. Because it's a targeted one, you don't have any side effects. They're targeted to only attach themselves into the cancer tumors but not other parts of the body. You use less amount of drugs and that means you have less side effects and also low cost as well. So this targeted drug delivery is going to really revolutionize the way we treat people. So now let me move towards water and energy. So really I'm giving you a broader perspective of where the nanotechnology is going to have an impact. Water. You know that billions of people don't have a clean drinking water. So that's a major challenge for us as a humanity. So again, nanotechnology is expected to have a huge impact in terms of desalination, nanofilters, which will allow only the water molecules to get through, and then the uh, salt molecules cannot get through by using the nanopores in these nanomembranes, for example. But also you can use photocatalysis, so thereby you can really clean the water wherever you have, and thereby you'll be able to really provide a much cleaner drinking water and then the UV LEDs, which we are working on, in fact, Deepankar is here in the audience, and I'll come back and I'll show you. Energy. Energy is a major global issue. This is a number one global issue for the humanity all over the world. In fact, you may lose even your prime minister's position if you really don't get the right uh, policy in terms of that. It's a controversial issue as well. So really, nanotechnology is expected to have a huge impact in terms of photovoltaics, that means solar cells. And whenever you say that solar cell is 20% efficient, 80% of the energy is wasted in heat. Can we really develop materials which can convert the heat into electricity? That is called thermoelectrics. And again, hydrogen separation membranes, hydrogen storage, and again, hydrogen economy purposes, photocatalysis, where you can take water and then be able to split into hydrogen and oxygen so that you can really create, create clean hydrogens from the clean source of water without having to use hydrocarbons and petrol and other things, and the fuel cells and supercapacitors and solid state lighting. I'll try to cover some aspects of these ones. So solar cells, already people have developed solar cells using the materials which we work on at about 46% efficient solar cells. Your rooftop solar cells may be about 15% efficient or 20% efficient, and people have already developed 46% efficient solar cells. So the only problem is they're expensive. 
So where can we use these solar cells? And of course, space applications. In fact, these solar cells have been developed for space applications by Boeing, National Renewable Energy Laboratory in US, and Fraunhofer in Germany also. So by stacking different materials, you can really get uh, very high performance solar cells. So once the 40% efficiency is exceeded, and people now started thinking about how can we use these space solar cells for terrestrial applications on the ground. So if you got these concentrator systems, and you can see that you're collecting the light from the sun and concentrating into about 500 suns or 1,000 suns here, because the system cost is so high, and then the additional cost of the solar cells is not that significant, people want to really use high efficiency solar cells. And these are these multi-junction solar cells. And there you want to keep it here. So thereby, you'll be able to collect all the light which has got from the sun, about 500 suns intensity or so, and be, convert, be able to convert into electricity. It is becoming economically viable even for terrestrial applications. So that's why there's a lot of interest out there. So here is a case where, in this case, what we do is that we use three different materials. We stack one on top of the other. So this material absorbs this part of the solar spectrum. This material absorbs this part of the solar spectrum. This material absorbs the other part of the solar spectrum. So that's why you're able to get those efficiencies as high as 46% or so. In fact, we have been working in some of these material systems. And what we're doing is that how can we reduce the cost? Because OK, you, don't have to, you cannot have in your backyard huge large uh, con solar concentrator system. And can we make some nanostructures of nano wires of these materials? and then we embed them in a polymer material so that you can really attach them onto the roof. And then the challenge is to be able to get the high efficiency at a low cost. So that's where the challenge is. Whenever you're developing these technologies, we want to be able to make them affordable and also at the same time most efficient. So typically, if you want to have, of course, this is an old slide, maybe the cost might have come down a bit. A 14% solar cells typically cost about $100 per square meter. And our, our aim is to be able to make them for $1 for uh, one meter square. So that's what the aim of these sorts of new technologies which we are trying to develop. Nanotechnology for cars. Again, cars nanotechnology is, going to have, is expected to have a huge impact. Lighter and stronger materials, that means fuel efficiency and safety. Improved engine efficiency of fuel additives and catalysis. And reduced environmental impact in of using hydrogen and fuel cells and a range of things, including electric cars of uh, Brian's favorites. So longer service life and lower component failure rate and small ma smart materials even to self-repair themselves. So whenever you got a dent and the material can really repair itself and it come back to this one, so that means you don't have to worry about that. So in fact, sensors, of course, nano nanotechnology-based sensors are expected to be in the cars already. We're using a range of sensors. And for example, if your airbag sensors and other things are all already made out of this MEMS technology, which is nothing but the nanotechnology, and uh, people are expecting that a uh, large number of uh, nanoscale sensors will be used. For example, here, again, it's an American slide here, and you'll see gallons and pounds and other things. And uh, so currently, as you know, that the fuel consumption is very much dependent on the weight of the car. If you can really reduce the weight of the car to about 750 pounds, so for my Australian young colleagues, and divide that one by two approximately of kilos, at about 370, 350 kilos or so, and you'll be using about one gallon for 100 miles about 160 kilometers and uh, about 3.8 uh, liters of uh, petrol or so. So really, by using these lightweight, stronger materials and efficient engines, you'll be able to really reach that point. And again, some of these carbon nanotubes and other materials could be used as a composites, but the challenge is some of these materials are quite expensive, and then we want to be able to really go from $250 or $1 million per kilo to $4 a kilo. So that's where the challenge is. How do we really make these technologies really economically viable so that we can have widespread use? Supercapacitors. So whenever you're dealing with electric cars, and then you always use batteries, and of course, sometimes you can also use fuel cells in some of the cars. And then the problem with batteries is that they got a high energy density. That means you can go long distance, but their power density is pretty low. So you need to use the supercapacitors when you're starting the car so that you get the momentum which is needed and you can the next the batteries will take over. These capacitors, again, supercapacitors are made out of nanotechnology. And if you use a nanoporous material, these nanoporous materials have got a large surface area. Larger the area, higher the capacitance. In fact, uh, CSIRO has developed uh, uh, these uh, supercapacitors. In fact, they've started a company called CapEx which is already manufacturing these supercapacitors. In fact, uh, done by one of the alumni of the ANU, Callum Drummond, 
while he was at CSIRO, and the supercapacitors and battery technologies are very much reliant on the nanotechnology because of the fact that you've got a large surface area, you'll be able to store more energy much more efficiently. But again, in the case of batteries, people want to be able to have the batteries which have got a range of at least 350 kilometers and be able to recharge in three minutes. Of course, current batteries, you cannot recharge them that quickly. So if you're going and changing your petrol, it takes about five minutes. The same period can we really have the batteries which can be charged that quickly. So these are some of the cha technological challenges. Again, nanoparticles of this uh, lithium titanium oxide or lithium manganese oxide have been used as anode or a cathode. And then some of these uh, batteries have been being developed now. And they could also potentially be not only used for cars and also for laptops and other uh, practical devices like your phones and other things as well. So whenever we talk about energy, we only talk about generation of energy. We should also be thinking of utilization of energy as well. Because if you don't do that one, and we are wasting a lot of our energy which we are really generating, that means we are unnecessarily creating more greenhouse gas emissions. So here is a case of the, the night, uh, world in night. And of course, you cannot have this picture. It's a composite picture created by NASA. You can see America brightly lit, and Europe, and India. And uh, so the, uh, the, in, uh, of course, Asia, and Japan, and Australia, of course, most of the population in the coastal region, and New Zealand here. So really, we are used about 20% of the electricity is used for lighting purposes. So for example, that's a US example here again. If you can reduce the energy consumption or improve the efficiency by 1%, you, only, you don't need five gigawatt power plants in US alone. So now we can imagine that how many power plants you don't need if you can really improve the efficiency of these uh, lighting systems. As you know that uh, we as we started off with the lighting from the fire, and then of course we've gone for the incandescent lamps, and the fluorescent is only 5% efficient. Fluorescent lamps are compact fluorescent, are about 25% efficient. The LED technology, which has started in only late 90s or so, now already reaching about 50% efficiency or so. So as you, most of you know that in Canberra, and our government has provided us LED lights. That means we are consuming less energy. That's a good way to do it. But of course, the next generation technologies will have even much more efficient uh, devices. If you can replace these 25% efficient uh, lights with 50% efficient lights, about 50 gigawatt power plants are not in the US alone. But now we can imagine again how much energy savings we can have by using utilization of the energy much more efficiently. And white LEDs, in fact, we work on these materials. In fact, uh, some of my students are manufacturing uh, uh, a few million LEDs a month in China. And uh, they've done PhDs with us here. In fact, again, development of the blue LED was a major challenge. In fact, the colleagues from Japan, those who developed that one, have won the Nobel Prize in 2014. And then the Nobel Committee said not only the development of the blue LED, environmental impact of that work, uh, which is really helping this, uh, society. And that's why they've been given that particular thing. So what you could do is that you can take a UV LED or a uh, blue LED and put a phosphor, you end up getting white light. And that's how people are really using these technologies. And uh, so really, it becomes a com commodity product. But of course, efficiencies have been improved with time. And in fact, we expect to have much more efficient devices. So now let me move towards my own research and what I'm trying to do in the last few minutes or so. As Brian said that he wants to listen to what I'm doing. And uh, so I told you in the broader sense where the nanotechnology is going to impact in our daily lives. So we work on semiconductors, and we work on slightly different semiconductors. So silicon is a workforce for the microelectronics industry. But unfortunately, silicon is not a very good light emitter. So that's why we have to use materials like gallium nitride, indium nitride, this combination of these materials in this group three of the periodic table and the group five of the periodic table. So whenever you're making these blue LEDs and other things, they're all made out of this gallium nitride, indium nitride technology. And then the red ones are made out of this gallium indium phosphide technology or so. So we work on these materials to develop the LEDs and lasers and other things. So for example, when you're dealing with uh, optical fibers, internet, whenever you are sending information, whether from your phone or from your computer, and your electrical signal needs to be converted into light signal, and we work on these lasers. And then you switch these lasers on and off to send the information through an optical fiber. On the other end, you have to convert that light into electricity again so that you can hear the voice, or otherwise you get your data back. So we work on these photo detectors on this end as well. So really, some of the lasers which we developed in the 90s are already currently being used in the internet, which is pumping these internet optical fibers and other things. And now we are developing the next generation. If I've got a laser which is small, and then I can switch it on and off faster, 
That means I can send information much faster. And the smaller devices also consume less energy. In fact, 5% of the world's electricity you currently use for internet, and in fact, it's doubling usage every 10 years or so. So really, we need to develop the technologies which consume less energy, much faster, because we all want to have faster technologies. And uh, so that's where we are developing some of these uh, LED technologies and photodetector technologies. So again, this LED technology has led to solid state lighting and a large area displays based on the LED, LED TVs, again, are made, making use of some of these LED technologies some of us have developed. Of course, many groups work globally as well. Again, infrared detectors, which are developed uh, using these materials for biomedical imaging applications, night vision applications or so, and again, solar cells, which I've already talked about. So really, these, these are the materials which are very inter interesting and exciting. UV LEDs, why we want to have UV LEDs. You know, when you talk about uh, purification of water, and using membranes and other things is one way, and exposure of the bacteria and other things to UV light, you can kill them because uh, it's, uh, UV, UV radiation will really uh, changes their DNA and other things sort of thing. So really, one of the challenges is that currently we use these large sterilization plants and in the, the operation theaters and others, but uh, they also use the toxic materials like mercury and they're not very efficient. If you can really make light emitting diodes, emitting in the UV light, that means you can have a light where you can put into this water which is not very good, and within minutes you should be able to drink that water because all the bacteria have been killed. And even you can have a bottle and, uh, which has got this LED light, so that means you, know, you fill that button and switch it on, and then be able to drink it wherever you go sort of thing. But again, the efficiency of these LEDs is also not as good as we would like it to be. In fact, this is a PhD project which Deepank Chuk is working on using this hexagonal borate nitride, again, a two-dimensional material, we are really trying to understand how to make these things, how to make these UV LEDs most efficient, and again, with low energy consumption as well. And we have been developing some smallest lasers in the world. And I told you that smaller the lasers and they consume less energy, you can switch them on and off uh, fast. And in fact, this is the work of my student, Drew Saxena, who is now a postdoc in Imperial College. And essentially, we make these lasers, and uh, these are, I can put about uh, 20 lasers within the width of your hair. Of course, depends on what is the width of your hair. I told you it's quite big, or quite, it can change. And really, they're tiny, tiny lasers. I cannot see them with my naked eye, but they're emitting light, which I can see the light which is coming out of those ones. So that means I can pack more lasers in a particular package. I can send more information much faster. And so these are the next generation laser technology which we are developing for the internet applications. So again, terahertz radiation. And uh, we used to do, we have got a lot of uh, electronics. We talk about microwaves and millimeter waves. And when you talk about light, we talk about up to infrared re radiation or so. But there's a gap called terahertz radiation. And in fact, uh, terahertz radiation is very useful for a wide range of applications. For example, many of the molecules have got fingerprints in the terahertz part of the spectrum. For example, lactose and anhydrides and other things, and also explosives. These explosives have got the signatures in the terahertz part of the spectrum. In the past, there were no technologies which were not available where you are able to detect them from a distance. So we're developing some of these uh, technologies. And uh, again, terahertz radiation is reflected. Uh, metals are reflecting the terahertz radiation. So that means you, know, you don't have to use x-rays anymore. You should be able to really detect. And most importantly, terahertz radiation is non-ionizing. That means if you have a terahertz radiation is exposed and your body is not going to be affected, but I cannot say the same thing with x-rays. So that's where people are really developing these uh, X, the terahertz scanners and other things. And again, you can look at the cavities in the teeth. And people are talking about even having a wireless communications. There you got a kiosk there. And essentially, you take a phone or whatever the device you have. And wirelessly, you can download this information because terahertz frequencies are very, very high frequencies with respect to microwave frequencies or so, which you are talking about. So that's why there's a lot of interest, including even in the uh, agriculture, where you can even look at uh, what amount of water content in the leaves, so thereby you can determine when you want to water the plants, so thereby you can conserve your water resources quite efficiently. We've been developing both the sources and detectors, and this is the work of Kun Peng, who just left for Oxford University as a postdoctoral fellow, and then these detectors are very efficient detectors, which have got a bandwidth of about 0.1 terahertz to about 3 terahertz or so, and using two different antenna designs, which I won't go into details, but the key thing is that we're developing technologies are very, very tiny again. 
I can put multiple detectors so that you get a beautiful image, so that I can be able to really look at your teeth, which that image which I showed you is not as good. You can be able to look at them much more precisely, so that we'll be able to really, uh, the dentist will be able to identify those ones. Thereby, dentists don't really start taking too many pictures using x-rays, which is also not good for you in the longer term. Solar cells. Again, I was telling you we are working on nanowire solar cells, and again, we are working with Oxford University, a flexible solar cells. We are embedding these nanowires within a polymer material, so that means you can really take these things out and you can put your backpack or uh, on, on, on your car roof or anything of that sort. And again, the challenge is to be able to make them efficient and economically uh, viable processes. And again, that's what something which we are trying to understand, how these solar cells work. And again, some of the students, those are working in these sorts of topics are sitting here in the audience as well. Splitting of water. And so, of course, uh, the challenge is that, you know, of course, uh, the dream has always been, can we really split water and then be able to do it efficiently? You can, in fact, split water very easily by using electrolysis process of putting two metals into water and apply some electric field or so. But then the efficient process is not that efficient. So we are developing some semiconductor photoanodes and cathodes, thereby shine the light, and then they create these so-called electron hole pairs, and they go and start oxidizing water. So thereby, we'll be able to really create a most efficient hydrogen source using water, and then use it as a fuel, and then be able to combine with oxygen, and then be able to get water again. So that means it's a very clean energy cycle. But of course, the efficiency of the technology is currently is not that good. And again, nanotechnology, I was telling you, because a large nano surface area, which helps us to be able to really make uh, these as the most efficient uh, 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 photocatalysis uh, uh, processes, which we are really working on. Again, some of the students and postdocs and colleagues, those who are working in this area, have been listed there. Let me finish off with the last topic, which I want to cover the brain and, uh, and the neurons. As all of us know that, uh, of course, most of our functions are emotions, are the vision, are movement, are language, are emotions, and smell, intelligence, and decisions. They're all due to the functions which are in the brain. And all of us have got about 100 million neurons. They're all formed into nice networks like this. These are the individual neurons, and they're all connected using something called processes, and you create these neuronal networks. So now, if I got the injury for the brain, to the brain, so then what happens is that you have a loss of memory or movement or vision, and can we really restore these neuronal circuits which have been broken due to neurological disorders or due to brain damage due to one accident or the other? And already some work has been carried out in tissue engineering to be able to repair the spinal cord injuries and also peripheral nerve injuries. Can we do to the brain to that one? Really, that's a major uh, holy grail in the neuroscience. Can we, first of all, of course, we have to understand brain. We know so little. And then whenever you learn, you do more research, you realize you so know even more, you, you realize that you have known much little than what you thought of your known sort of thing. So it's a very complex, by the way, very energy efficient machine. It only uses less than 100 watts of energy and it does the functions which are, uh, which are a supercomputer cannot do. Of course, memory also and other things. So really, brain is a great machine. And uh, so what, what can we do? So whenever you got these uh, neuronal uh, structures like this, and whenever you got a damage, and of course, uh, you have a problem. Can we put a neural patch here? Can I remove this damage so thereby I can make the, new, the connections back? So thereby, can I get the functions back again or not? Sure. So in fact, this is the work of uh, Vinnie Gautam, my po uh, postdoctoral fellow, in fact, who came to join her husband in Earth Sciences, who is a DECRA fellow. And uh, so she, this is a project which we just started uh, uh, without any funding. And uh, she works jointly with our John Curtin School of Medical Research and also our engineering colleagues uh, between physics and engineering and neuroscience. It's a truly multidisciplinary project. Uh, and this would have not happened without Vinnie and her skills. So again, that's a key people are important uh, in addition to money, of course, uh, which I'm sure that uh, uh, which uh, I can get from our vice chancellor. Uh, so sometime, right? So here is a case where we have created these nano scaffolds of these indium phosphide nanowires, which we have made in our laboratory using this so-called the top-down process and the bottom-up processes as well. Here is a neuronal cell. You can see these processes beautifully follow these patterns very nicely. You know. They like to go along a particular process here. This is a cell body, and then they're making these things. I'm only showing you one neuronal cell. So what will happen if you've got more neuronal cells? So they really form into beautiful networks. You can see this, uh, these are the neuronal cells, and then, of course, they're all forming into a nice network. And this is the part where you got this nano scaffold of the nano wires, which we have really created in an ordered pattern or so. 
So now, we'll try to go and look at these ones. And in fact, Winnie, what she does is that she does some calcium imaging. She puts a calcium dye and they start taking videos of those things. Whenever these neurons are opening up and uh, firing the action potentials, and then they, these you know, calcium uh, ions are really creating the green light, and she takes a video of that. Here's a case of the video for the nano scaffolds where she has grown, and also she has grown some neurons on the plain glass. As you can see, these neurons are randomly distributed. So now, what she does is that if this neuron is firing, what is happening to the other neurons? And she creates these correlation maps and thereby she can see whether they're talking to each other, they're randomly firing the signals, and uh, so thereby we can really understand how these things are working. So whenever you've got these glass slide neurons, and you can see that they're all firing at different times. You know, there's a time here, and then these are the signals which she has been measuring using calcium imaging. So when we've done this uh, ones which are on these nano scaffolds, as you can see, they're beautifully firing all at the same time, indicating that there's some sort of a synchronized correlated activity is taking place they're talking to each other. That means you can really start thinking about how can we really make new connections and be able to make new, new, new communications and new synaptic connections and other things. In fact, Winnie has gone to Melbourne and then uh, gave a talk to the neuroscientists in Melbourne, and then they're all quite excited about it and started asking her, can you grow epileptic neurons? Can you grow uh, autistic neurons? Can you grow various uh, uh, neurological disorder neurons? Can we really bring the functions back or not? In fact, they've also tried to convince her Melbourne is a place to do neuroscience, not Canberra. And why don't you move to Canberra? And in fact, I had to convince her that, look, you know, Canberra is a great place. We can always collaborate. And I've collaborated with people from all over the world, and we don't have to worry about it. In fact, uh, today only she mailed these nano scaffolds to uh, Wollongong, because one of the colleagues in Melbourne, she moved to Wollongong, and they are going to grow the stem cells and of the humans to see how these neurons are growing or things. This is a really exciting project. But only problem is that she has got only funding till January or so. She has applied for DECRA, and I'm hoping and praying that she'll get her DECRA fellowship so that she can, we can be able to continue this project. This is a really exciting and stimulating project for me, along with other projects which we work on. I'm also learning a lot, because Winnie teaches me more about neuroscience, because I don't know much about neuroscience than what I teach her sort of thing. That's again, having good students and postdocs make all the difference, because they are the ones, those are in the lab and making things happening. And I've been very fortunate. I've had a wonderful group of students and postdocs and uh, uh, young researchers and uh, academic colleagues and collaborators all over the world. And that's what they, they've made my life so much fun. Let me finish off. And I think I've told you uh, some uh, the nanotechnology. And I can, uh, maybe if I were to give you a simple summary, we are having great fun. That's a message which I want to convey. That is the purpose of science as well. So I always tell people that the purpose of the university is, is to really train the next generation of scientists and engineers and, of course, other academics as well as, uh, uh, as, well as uh, really explore new ideas. If any technology has come leading to companies and other things, that's a bonus. But really, the exploring ideas is the main job of, uh, and the training of people is the main job of the universities. And as you can see, that it's a really an emerging technology and enabling technology. And it's going to have huge implications in terms of uh, uh, really using this nanotechnology for a range of applications. And one last point which I want to make is, environmental, toxicological effects, and ethical and life cycle issues need to be addressed or considered. Whenever we're developing new technologies, we should not blindly go and develop something without thinking through what are the implications of these technologies in the longer term, rather than we really look at after 10 years, oh, we made something wrong and we should have done something different. So that's why life cycle issues are really important when you're dealing with nanotechnologies. Let me leave with one slide. And uh, I started my life uh, in a small village in India Studied in front of a kerosene lamp till I finished year seven. And I lived with my high school maths teacher to be able to finish my high school or so. And so many people helped me in my life. And uh, as a gratitude to all of them, and uh, my wife and uh, I have started an endowment to be able to help people from the developing world. We get a lot of interns from Europe and America and all. But many times when any interns want to come and spend some time at the ANU, they all need fin financial support because European students come with their own support. And we always say, used to say no. And I was feeling guilty for the last 20 years or so, a couple of years back or so, we started this endowment. Last year, we had four students came from India, some of the brightest students you can really have from IITs. And this year, we had six students and one young academic also. So really, this is something which we really want to really help and support and grow that one. And of course, I understand that any donations to the ANU are tax deductible as well. And one of the most interesting things which I really want to point out is that more than 700 million African families do not have access to electricity. So as you know that I can tell you based on my first-hand experience, then using kerosene lamps 
are really detrimental for health. Till I finished my year seven, I used to get sick all the time. Now I realize that this must be due to smoking, uh, breathing of the kerosene lamp, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, fumes. So also the education is a major challenge because very limited amount of light is available. So because of the development of the nanotechnologies based on the LED technology and solar cell technology, now we can really provide these uh, solar lanterns or solar lamps. And by donating about five, four pounds or approximately eight dollars or so, you can really make a difference to a African family and help the young person to study and improve their health as well. To date, I have donated about 700 lamps and I want to donate 3,000 lamps by the time I retire. And again, I want you to think on what difference you want to make to the world. And I hope uh, you will really join these sorts of things and be able to really make a contribution to people, those who really need help sort of thing. Finally, I want to thank you for your attention.